Cast. Yeah, so in terms of, I'll get to sort of the how in a second, but what they should be doing, number one, is the luxury you have if you're a $5 million a year business is that you are probably an owner-operated uh, business, or even if you're not the day-to-day operator, you're certainly super involved in the business, right? And so from that standpoint, I like to think about who's the main character of your business. It's generally going to be the founder or the owner-operator who can be the face of the business. And so number one is you want to have a personality that's attached to the brand because people are generally more interested in following people than they are in following objects. Welcome to Think Business with Tyler, sharing our methods and strategies for success. Join in on our conversations with business owners as we highlight their triumphs and detail how they overcame the challenges they faced while continuing to grow and scale their business. It's time to think life, think success, and think business with your host, Tyler Martin. Welcome back. Today, we're diving deep with John Davids, a marketing mastermind who's all about harnessing the power of storytelling and emotional resonance. Ever wondered how the same story can captivate different audiences or why building a community could be your most powerful marketing strategy? John's got all the answers. Plus, we'll get a sneak peek into his upcoming book, Marketing Superpowers, Build a Brand, so good that getting customers feels like magic. Stick around to learn actionable tips on creating powerful content, leveraging platforms like Instagram and TikTok, and why mentorship could be the game changer your business needs. Let's get started. Hey, John, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Tyler, it is awesome to be here. Excited to be talking to you. Yeah, excited to have you here. Hey, I love to start out with learning a little bit about you. What do you do professionally? Professionally, I've been making my way through marketing for the last couple of decades. And I like to say that I uh, help people get more customers for their business. And I do that in all kinds of ways. That's awesome. What about personally? You got something that you're into on a personal note? Uh, family, kids, music, travel, all, all the good stuff. Wow. What kind of music do you like? So I actually have a degree in music. And so I studied wow. music for many years. Uh, I mean, these days I listen to... I mean, everything from top 40 to theater to Broadway to um, jazz, you name it. That is a wide range. Now, do you also play or do some type of interest instrument? I do. I, I paid my way through college partly by teaching piano. So I'm, wow. uh, I'm a piano teacher and I'm, I'm trying to get my daughters into it. Wow. So you're multi-talented. You probably can do like some little jingle, some marketing jingle that you can <laughs> use both skills, right? If I had the keys here, I'd play, I'd play right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, so I want to start with your story. I mean, you got a great story. In, in college, uh, I believe, was your first business you started, or at least one of your first businesses. And you actually built it to about a $300,000 a year business, which is, that's pretty impressive. Can we talk through, like, what, what was that business and what drove you at, while you're going through college? That sounds like a lot to handle. I'd love to just get into that whole story. So I was always really entrepreneurial as a kid. I had a snow shoveling business and I had all kinds of stuff that I would do to try to make money, partly because I just I had no money as a kid, didn't have a lot of money uh, in my family. And, and I wanted to be self-reliant from a, a pretty young age. And so in college, I stumbled on the world of the internet and internet marketing. And this was like early 2000s. And this is pre-BuzzFeed, pre-Facebook, pre a lot of the content that we would think about today. The biggest sites in the world actually at the time were Yahoo, uh, MSN, and AOL, which would go on to become partners of mine. But so in the early days, what I decided to do was I thought, you know, I love magazines. I've always loved just kind of content in general. And I thought, why don't I start an online magazine, which sounds super simple today, but at the time, there were no really big online magazines other than magazines that put their content on the internet. And there was no infrastructure for this. So there was no you know, advertising platforms. There were no nothing like a content management system or WordPress. You could just whip up a website. So I went through the process of building a website, paying somebody in China to build a website for me. And then what I did for content was I sent a letter to everyone in my college. I had the administration uh, agree to send a letter to everybody in the college uh, English department and journalism department studies to say, hey, there's a student who's starting a magazine online. Would you like to write for it? And so I ended up getting a whole bunch of writers uh, to, to write for my, my little magazine. And the big break after about six months of kind of putting content online and figuring out how to actually run an online magazine 
was I thought, I've got to be able to find traffic. And this was sort of the first moment uh, that sort of took me to today where I realized you've got to be able to hijack attention on the internet to really get anything done. Certainly, if you want to make money doing whatever you're doing. And so I started to reach out to the folks at MSN and AOL and Yahoo again, where they were, that's where all the eyeballs were back in the early 2000s on the internet. Right. And finally, after a ton of hassle, I got the guy at MSN to agree to put my content onto msn.com. And that's when it all took off. I built an ad business and yeah, I got it to about $300,000 a year, uh, super, super early. Does cash flow have you down? Profit, not where you think it should be? Maybe it's the long hours. Let's meet to see if I can help. I bridge driving the financial performance of your business to hit growth and success targets. Book a complimentary meeting at meetforgrowth.com to get started now. Once again, that's meetforgrowth.com. I look forward to talking with you. And thanks for listening to the show. I built an ad business and yeah, I got it to about $300,000 a year, uh, super, super early. Wow. So where was the revenue coming from? You were doing, when they came back to your blog, there would be like ad, was it, it wasn't Google ads because back then I don't think AdWords existed yet. Was it you just like going out to business owners and having them buy space or how were you monetizing that? It was Google AdWords. It was that four, oh, it was. four glorious lines of JavaScript that paid for my entire life. It was awesome. Uh, and, and then eventually I, I did build an actual direct ad sales business after that. But for the first while, it was just Google AdWords. Wow. Okay. And I may have said that wrong. Was it ad, actually, it was AdSense back then, wasn't it? So you were on the AdSense side, right? Yeah, this is in the weeds, yeah. but there was AdWords and AdSense. Yeah, yeah. And if you were making money, you were AdSense. You're right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, I, I remember, you know, I was in that world a little bit. I was building all these websites and trying to monetize them with Tech, contextual type advertising. It's when Ad, AdSense first came out. And I actually made decent money, but I got, after a while, I got slapped because I was using some like link farms and it didn't work out very well. So it didn't have a good ending, but that's a good story. So what, from there, what did you sell that business or do you just dissolve it after a while or what ended up happening? I did. So in 09, there was uh, another big, way bigger publishing company that was scooping up uh, all kinds of little websites like mine. And I like to say it was like a nuisance acquisition. You know, we weren't making all that much money. I mean, it was a one man show. I had a whole bunch of freelancers uh, by 2009. So it started in 2004. The story ends in 2009. And I basically, at that point, had built an advertising sales business. And the way advertising sales works is ad agencies will send out these things called RFPs or requests for proposals. And I was winning enough of those that the big guy said, hey, who is this dude getting the $50,000 deals that should be coming to us? Let's just buy him. And they picked me off. And it was a nice little uh, pile of money for, for, for me in 2009. Yeah, that's a cool win too. It's there's something special about building something from nothing and then people are willing someone's willing to pay you for it. It's kind of a cool win. Yeah, and it gives if nothing else it gives you confidence, it gives you a great story and it it tells you that hey, there's all kinds of ways to win. And like you said, you think about uh building a business and what does the acquisition look like? A lot of these things I, th I think when people start businesses these days, they put a lot of planning into like A to Z and you got to just think about A to B and B to C cuz Z sort of takes care of itself. And oftentimes it's not at all what you would think on day one. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great point. So in 2015, you now start in Fluicity. And I want to go back to a word you use. You use the word hijacking. But I want to tie it into Fluicity because I think it also, it, it probably streamlined with what you're doing now. I mean, how do you hijack someone's attention? I mean, especially now, let's even fast forward to today. There is just so much noise and so many things going on. How do you get that attention? How do you hijack someone's attention? So it's really about looking at the environment you're in right now. So the answer I'll give you for today uh, is yeah. very different from the answer I'd give you in 2004, 20 years ago. So I'll, I'll actually, I'll start with 2004 and I'll, I'll fast forward quickly to today. So great. I love that. 2004, you have to look at where is the attention. And I'm talking specifically on the internet because that was the early days of the internet. And the big transformation with offline to online is that you got rid of all the gatekeepers. So if you were pre-2000, the answer would have been much more cumbersome because you would basically say, hey, here are the 25 gatekeepers at the magazines, at the television stations, at the radio stations or local newspapers, and here's how you get to them and therefore you can unlock their audience. In the early 2000s, that all changed because you had this complete democratization 
thanks to the internet, you could you could just go on and create a blog. So in 2004, what I started to realize was where is the bulk of, of eyeballs going on the internet? They're all going to MSN, AOL, and Yahoo. The reason, super simple, is because those were the internet service providers and they just defaulted their homepage on everybody's browser. So that's where all the traffic was. And I went to their websites and I thought, you know, they're putting out all this edu- editorial content. I wonder how they're getting it. And the value that I realized was they're actually having to pay for it. What if I could give it to them for free? And that was my hack. It wasn't that I had such great content. It was that I realized, hey, it's content that's good enough. And I can give these folks lots of content for free. And in return, I said, all I want you to do is put related links back to my website. And so I created this fire hose of traffic. So to get to your question, you know, what does it mean to hijack? I literally went to the point in the system where the traffic was. And I said, hey, that fire hose that's pointing over there, I want it to point to me now. And the fire hose, boom, just came in. And so when you think about, again, fast forward to today, where are the eyeballs is question number one. The answer is they're much more spread out. They're on social media. They're on LinkedIn, TikTok, podcast, email. You've got to figure out where your audience is and then figure out the value that you can provide to whoever has the audience or where, you know uh, who, whoever's getting the audience right now such that it can come back to you. And there's a whole formula I go into in in my book, Marketing Superpowers, which we'll get to later. But figuring that out is step one. And then step two is figuring out, okay, what value can I provide to bring them back to me? Hmm. Because I, you know, I was, while I was doing research about you, I, I went to LinkedIn and I noticed you have a certain style when you're doing your posts on LinkedIn. It always starts with something like, not always, but a lot of times I read about or I it kind of has a very engaging opening line where I'm like, oh, I wonder what he read about or oh, I'm wondering what he he just saw or something. Is there a certain style in terms of when you're trying to get people's attention? Is there like is this a style? Is this the same style most people should use, or is it unique to you? Or what are your thoughts around that in terms of capturing people's attention? Yeah, the style you're referring to on LinkedIn took me about three years to home in on. So the stuff that I wrote three years ago is very different from what I'm writing today. The copywriting, uh, so like that, I would describe as copywriting. And okay. it's very important in a very crowded environment like LinkedIn. And this is true for any social platform where you're competing for attention in the feed to hook people on the very first second. In the case of LinkedIn, uh, you've got about 10 to 12 words to hook them. Everything beyond that, if they don't click see more, they're not going to see it. On TikTok, it's the first uh, about two and a half seconds. On Instagram, on Twitter, it it sort of has a a different... um, You have a different time and space for a hook on each platform. On LinkedIn, that opening sentence has to do a few things. It has to... A, capture your attention because something that I'm talking about is interesting. I have to generally foreshadow what I'm talking about in the in the piece. And I have to do it in a way that you can digest it in a matter of seconds, in a matter of one to two seconds. And so, yeah, that's all part of the copywriting formula. I generally will, will look at ADA, attention, interest, desire, action. You've got to start with that piece of attention. How do you get people to just want to read a little bit more? And you'll see that in every piece I write. Are you conscious? I've heard, so that first hook, you're trying to get them to read. Do you consciously think about, I heard like a lot of times you're trying, every sentence is to get them to read the next sentence. So it's almost like they're one hook after another. Do you consciously do that in your writing or... What's your thoughts around that? I do that. So you you want to make you are right. The purpose of attention is to get them to read the next line. The purpose of the next line is to get them to read, to read the next line. That's true. I would say for the first three to four lines. At a certain point, you do have people down the slippery slope where they're actually going to keep reading as long as you continue to give them value. Now, if you ask me about copywriting, I'm a copywriting fanatic. So I'm the kind of person that will look at one sentence and literally spend an hour tweaking that sentence to make sure it's exactly right. I'll count the syllables. I'll read it like it's a poem and I'll just kind of see how it sounds audibly. So I'm very conscious of those things. But to answer your question, I would say that once you get somebody three or four sentences in, they will keep reading as long as you continue to provide value. So what you want to make sure of is that you actually are providing value the whole time. And the way that I write is actually bottom up. So I start with the meat of it and the hook that you're reading that you're describing right now is typically the last thing I write. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. So yeah, it sounds like what you're saying is once they're engaged and they're actually now somewhat invested in your 
whatever they happen to be reading, they're more likely to stick as long as the value continues to happen during that post is what, what I think I'm hearing you say. That's interesting. So, you know, what I have, what I see a lot, you know, I have a lot of small business clients. They vary. They're anywhere under, I'd say 20 million in revenue. Most of the clients get a lot of their business through paid advertisement. And a lot of times it's Google or different channels. Some of it's organic, but most of it's paid. There is an undertone, a concern, I would say, in the small business community about, wow, you know, I understand there's going to be changes from algorithms and it's going to be harder to get tra- attention, eyeballs to my to on my ads. I may not even be able to compete. Like I have a certain industry right now. There's larger players coming into the industry and they're throwing big dollars on Google ads and it's kind of suffocating the, my smaller clients. So what are your thoughts around, like, what's your feeling around the future of getting attention, advertising, especially in the small business world? I mean, do you have any thoughts that in terms of what businesses can do to insulate themselves a little bit towards that? Or any, what, what are your thoughts when you hear this? I have a lot of thoughts. So (laughs) the thing I talk about the most is this term customer communities. And people hear that and they they don't really know what it means. And that's totally fine. I I, I get it. It took me a while to figure out what it means and how important it is. So I, I think about building community as the most defensible thing you can do in your business. Google can't break you. Uh, Facebook can't break you. If you have a community of people that genuinely care about what you're doing and what you're talking about, you will survive. And and the form of that will look different depending on, again, what era you're in. A community could be a podcast, email, social, but you have to have people that are that are there. So I'll, I'll break it that down in a couple, a couple uh, ways. So first off, I actually don't even use the word ads anymore, advertisement. I think it's a dirty word. I think about content that you put paid media behind. So the way we make ads at Influicity for our clients and for, for myself, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, let's take a piece of content. Let's put it out on social media. Let's do that 20, 30, 40 times. See what's resonating with people. And then what's performing the best will put paid media behind. And that effectively becomes your ad. But you, you've you test marketed it in the most fair environment in the world. You're using the smartest algorithms in the world the billion dollar meta and Google al- algorithms to test what content is of interest. And then if something works organically, it's going to do really well in a paid environment. Every ad that that I put dollars behind, again, for myself or for our clients, we're testing those beforehand in an organic environment. So that's number one. I would say don't put your dollars behind something you haven't tested. The world of, of interruption marketing is just not working like it used to because people have too many options. And the second thing I would say, just going back to the customer community piece, is you really want to look for your ideal clients. And the formula, I, I created this thing called the movement formula. I talk about a bunch in the book, which is essentially you have to have a common belief, a unifying belief that people can get behind. You've got to be creating faith and you have to be getting people to take action. So the unifying belief is what does my brand stand for? What is it that I believe that makes me unique, that makes me a little bit different? The content you're putting out is generally all going to be about building faith. So it's here are stories that tell you that what I'm saying is true. Here's research. Here's a book. Here's an expert. Here's something that tells you that what I'm doing is true. 80% of every brand's content is essentially just building faith in the main thing that you're talking about. And then action, of course, is buy my product, try this sample, sign up to, to the newsletter, or what have you. And that's the cadence that that all great brands are built on. Uh, at least from what I've seen. So when you start, thanks for that explanation. That was awesome. Going back to kind of the original, what you were talking about, as you said, community, you you should really be building community. What I think a common objection I would hear to that, and I'd be curious your thoughts, is, well, an example. I have a client that does flooring. And I remember when he first came to me, he's like, dude, I just do flooring. Like I I get get it from Home Depot and I install it. Uh, It's just flooring. I mean, everybody has the same thing. There's nothing unique that I'm doing. Or maybe another client that does septic pumps. They literally pump waste out of a person's home once every three years. How do you build their their common comment to about building community would be, how do I build community with that? I mean, like nobody's getting excited about that type of stuff. I mean, what are your thoughts? Again, there's there's so much there. Wow. I mean, when you said septic pump, I, I like my, I'm getting tingles just thinking about this. <laughs> so Man, I love you. <laughs> when you're talking about septic pumps, so right now, and, and I'm not a, I, I don't know uh, much much about the subject, but let's just take some yeah. super broad uh, things that touch on emotions. So number one, 
you're talking about your home, your family. You're talking about being clean. You're talking about germs, bacteria. My kids could get sick. So immediately when I think about something that keeps my home clean and sanitary and safe, I'm thinking about family. You know, do what's right for your kids. Do you want your kids getting sick? Do you want your wife getting sick? Well, what is that going to mean? So I would start from an emotional standpoint and flooring again, it's safety, it's happiness, it's it's family time. So when you talk about subjects like that, another one I was thinking about recently, we have a client in the carpet cleaning space, and there was a bunch of research done that basically showed that if you don't have your carpets cleaned and sanitized every six months or so, there's a lot of, of airborne illnesses, stuff gets stuck in the carpet. You need to be cleaning that, that stuff out. So when you're talking about things that touch on someone's health, family, love, those core human instincts around, you know, we, we think about health, wealth, love as kind of our main drivers. I'd be talking about, hey, the belief is you and your family should be safe in your home. The faith builders there are, here's all the things that you don't even know about, but if you knew you would take this kind of action and hey, if you and when you're ready to take that action, I can help you because I do septic pumps. I do carpet cleaning. I do flooring. That's how I'd think about it. If you're a business owner feeling stuck in your business, overwhelmed, responsible for everything that happens, and working long hours, Tyler helps his clients develop processes, hire high-performing team members, and better understand their financial metrics and numbers to allow for a more predictable, less hands-on business. To schedule a free, no-pressure consultation, head to thinktyler.com and click the meeting button. Tyler would love to see if he can help you work on your business, not in your business. Schedule a consultation today at thinktyler.com. Think life, think success, think business. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Tulusma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Tulusma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on ElectroCast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. ElectroCast. I can help you because I do septic pumps. I do carpet cleaning. I do flooring. That's how I'd think about it. That's cool. I see, I see where that angle on that. So what are your thoughts when we're talking about a business owner, you know, they, let's say, you know, $5 million a year business, and they're trying to grow and scale their company. They're trying to get their branding out there. What are things that they should be doing in your mind? Like what, what are basics that you would want a business at that size to be doing and being focused on? Should they have a fractional like marketing person? What, where should they be at? Yeah. So, so in, in terms of, I'll get to sort of the how in a second, but what, sure. what they should be doing, number one, is the luxury you have if you're a $5 million a year business is that you are probably an owner-operated uh, business, or even if you're not the day-to-day -day operator, you're certainly super involved in the business, right? And so from that standpoint, I like to think about who's the main character of your business it's generally going to be the founder or the owner operator who can be the face of the business. And so number one is you want to have a personality that's attached to the brand because people are generally more interested in following people than they are in following objects. I like to say, if, if I like a restaurant, I'm probably more interested in the chef than I am in the potato. I don't feel a connection to a piece of food. But the chef, the story, how they make the food, how they pick the vegetables, that's super interesting to me. And it's the same thing with whether you're doing household jobs or you're fixing cars or you're laying down lumber, whatever it is, you are somebody that has a story and there's a reason you got into this. So number one is who's the main character that is going to be the voice of the brand? And then number two is you've got to be putting out content on social media that hits some type of emotion when people are scrolling through the feed. And so the reason I start with social media, because people think about, well, should I do a podcast? Should I have a newsletter? Yeah, but you're going to be able to get, get people to find you on social. So whether it's Instagram, TikTok, B2B, you want to be on LinkedIn, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So finding that social media platform is number one. Having the voice, of course, is number two. That's you, You're going to sort of do it at the same time. And then thinking of the storylines of what is my content going to be about. So again, going back to that person who thinks, well, there's uh, what I do is super simple. I paint walls. So what could I possibly talk about? 
Again, it's finding the emotion in it and then just telling those stories over and over again. And then to your last point about how, if you can do it yourself, awesome, or certainly a fractional CMO, an agency that has a track record in your space to do it for you, those are all good options. So I think I'm hearing you say, regardless of the industry you're in, you can probably come up with an emotional connection and story related that's going to intertwine with whatever industry you're in. Is, am I saying that right? You're saying it right. It's it's not always going to be the same story. It's generally going to hit on... Oh, no, I get that. Yeah. It's going to hit on a pillar of, of very broadly health, wealth, or love. The pursuit of one of those things pretty much fits everything that people do. And that should actually come out in, in your content, in any way you market, that should be what is coming in your mind. That should be coming out in your marketing. Is that? Am I saying that correctly? I don't want to put words in your mouth. It should be coming out. I, I would say that not everything has to... So I, I, I don't want people leaving this thinking like, oh, everything I do has to have some emotional resonance. That's not true. Things can be funny. Things can be shocking. Things can be emotional. They can tug at your heartstrings. They can make you laugh. So there's different ways to express the content. But ultimately, what do people care about? Do they care about wooden floors? No. They care about having a beautiful home or they care about keeping their family safe. And so those are the things that you want to talk about versus the actual solution. There's a difference between the why and the how. So it's like, it's like, why do you want this? I'll give you the best example I, I always use is like if you talk to a personal trainer. And they say you should you should eat this, you should uh, walk this many is this amount of time, and all these things. And it's like cool, but why? Well, because you want to get a flat tummy, you want to lose weight. If you don't say the part about me getting a flat tummy, I don't care about anything else. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to pick your brain here. CFO services. Let's say I you know I I offer that as part of my services. What you know, oftentimes I talk about you know the financial security side of it, uh, feeling comfortable. Uh, with your finances, with your cash flow, things like that. Where would you, if you were in my shoes, where would you be talking? You're tar- you're you're targeting small business owners. Yeah, usually under twenty million, somewhere in that. Like the typical range is somewhere around five to say seven million is where my services are probably most needed in annual revenue. Yeah, I think if you are somebody that is running a business that is sub, let's say twenty million or ten million or five million dollars a year, cash flow is is super important, and it's not just business; it is personal. Because you got to make payroll. You got to pay your vendors. You got to pay your rent. The rent is always due next month. No matter how well you did this month, rent is due next month. So I'd be, I'd be appealing to the, if you're appealing to the, the owner operator, I'd be appealing to the emotional side of, hey, this is not just number crunching. I'm not just doing accounting services. I'm giving you peace of mind that you're going to be able to make payroll. I'm giving you peace of mind that you're going to have a profit at the end of the year so you can take your family on that on that baller vacation that you want to go on. You want, you can buy that new car. So, I, and I'm not saying all the content would be about that, but that is certainly, you know, again, if you are in that customer demographic, I have a lot of friends that are in that demographic. That's what they're thinking about. Yeah, that's great. I love the way you break it down. You make it very easy to understand. Going a little deeper here, where should like as a business owner, where should we be? Like, is it going to be different for everybody? Like, should we be doing email marketing? Should we be on TikTok? Should we be on YouTube? Is it should be on LinkedIn? Is there generally like a certain area where you're seeing most people should be, or is it totally independent upon every business? So it's about there's a, there's three considerations, and I talk about all this in the book. So there's the yeah. platform that you as a creator, and when I say you, it could be the owner operator, it could be a spokesperson that you hire, could be the marketing team. Where are you as a creator comfortable being? That's number one. Number two, what kind of content are you comfortable making? So is it written? Is it video? Is it photo? And again, this is going to lend itself based on the, the the stuff that you're comfortable making, and also. The stuff that you are doing. So if you are, if you're somebody that paints houses and you say, I only want to write text content, then my answer is, yeah, but people are probably going to want to see the painted houses. So you might want some photos in there too. So in those cases, you need to be thinking about that. And then number three is where's the audience? Now, the reason I put that at number three is because the truth is your audience is everywhere. You, you, you know, if you're trying to reach people in B2B, yeah, the obvious answer is LinkedIn, and, and I'm very active on LinkedIn, but they're also on Instagram. They're also on YouTube. They're in other places. So it's the reason I put that last is because if you said to me, hey, I'm doing B2B, so I should be on LinkedIn, but I have this YouTube channel with 60,000 subscribers that's on fire, then my answer would be, well, then just keep doing YouTube because you'll find those same people there. 
So figuring out those three things, and then from there, you just have to keep going and, and, and come up with a, a content engine or some way that you can keep telling the same story over and over again in that place. And one other point I'll make, Tyler, because I think this is important. One, one area people get intimidated in is they say, how can I tell this story more than once? Like, I've already said what I do. I've already made the point, John, that you just told me to talk about family and this and that. I did that. What next? You can tell the same story 50 times in 50 different ways, different perspectives, uh, different ways of saying it. And then when you're done, start at number one again and keep telling the story. Some of my best performing content on social, I've posted 15 times and it keeps doing better and better each time. And so you, you've got to think about the longevity of it, not just doing it once and forgetting about it. Yeah. I love you say that. I've been playing around on YouTube more doing things with, I have someone helping me. And a lot of our, our materials are becoming redundant. And he has to keep saying to me, it's okay. You can keep saying the same thing. You can just say it from a different angle, say it. And it's hard because us as business owners, we feel like we're repeating ourselves. But the truth is, you know, what he said to me is, hey, the same people aren't always watching anyway. So it's like, they don't even remember what you said last week, trust me. And so it's hard though. You have to rethink your brain. I'm sure there's a lot of people out in the audience that feel the same way. You have to rethink your brain to go, no, it's okay to do that. You've got to repeat yourself. Most people aren't listening. And when they do listen, they forget, certainly three, four months later. And you've got to be okay telling the same story over and over again, because it's sort of like going and and seeing a band perform. I could see the same song 50 times. I'm still going to enjoy it. And you know, comedy sketches are similar. Yeah, I heard that comedy bit two years ago, but let me hear it again. I'm interested in it. So people don't get tired of things as fast as you think they do. Yeah. Do you have a bias in terms of where what you see most most effective? I understand it really depends on the individual and what they want to do, but is is video or is written? Do you any bias in terms of what you think kind of gets better results? You know, it cycles. And every time I give an answer to this, six months later, I change the answer. So right now, what we're seeing is on Instagram, Instagram and TikTok, obviously TikTok, but video is doing really well. These short, punchy, get to the point type videos. And you can get to the point in the first few seconds and then draw it out and tell a longer story. But you definitely want to get people's attention pretty quickly. On LinkedIn, longer form posts generally work better. So if you're going to do a post on LinkedIn, you want it to get read. Don't be afraid to, again, get people's attention early on. But then you can write two or 300 words. As long as it's interesting, LinkedIn does like serving up those types of, of posts. So if you can get good at making content in whatever format you're doing it, there's always a platform for it. And that's why I say you want to match the creator with the type of content. Because if you happen to be great at video, there's always going to be an audience for video. You just have to be really good at making it. Right. You know, a lot of people, when you say creator, a lot of people in the business world are like, hey, I'm not really a content creator. I'm more, you know, I'm good at doing floors or painting walls or whatever that uh, septic tanks, pumping tub septic tanks, whatever happens to be. What are your thoughts around that? Is that where you come in or is that, is it like, well, no, learn your, learn to be a creator. What are your thoughts? Yeah, being a creator, I think definitely it's it's a little bit of a of a, a term that's been polluted. You know, you think about Mr. Beast or I'm going to be Kim Kardashian, and that, that's not what I mean. I don't mean that you have to drop your day job and become a full time creator. I mean that you have to be somebody who is. I'll, I'll use the term because I use it in the book. I'll say main character. So who's the main character of your brand of your story? And if you can think of a way to capture the content, so some people are super comfortable. Uh, blogging, taking an hour a week and, and writing a blog, or they they don't mind picking up their camera or their iPhone uh, because they're on the job site and saying, hey guys, I just caught this. And they're going to get a lot of people watching that. So if you can do those things, that's fine. Uh, if you can't do those things, then hire a videographer, a ghostwriter, a photographer to spend a couple hours a month with you just to make the content. And then your social media assistant uh, or whatever assistant you have to post the content can actually post it. So you don't need to make it a full-time job. But if you are going to be responsible for the marketing in your business, you do need to do it. And if you're not, that's totally fine. Hire a fractional CMO or an agency to take care of that for you. It's a lot of our clients at Influicity bring us on for that exact reason. But we still need to have something to talk about. And so that's where you have to pay attention. Do you have any rule of thumb in terms of investment into marketing and advertising, what type of return you should be seeing? 
It's a great question. So there's obviously the, the direct return and the indirect return. The, the direct return is much easier to, to manage. So if you're running Google ads or Facebook ads, obviously depends what your gross margins are, what your contribution margins are. But what you're looking at is, let's say, one to four. For every dollar I spend in the ideal world, I'm making $4. And I know some okay. people are listening to that and they're saying, oh, that's that's way too much. And some are listening and say, that's nothing. Again, super dependent on what it is you're selling sure. uh, and make sure that your gross margins make sense. In the indirect world, which is where we play a lot more, we have this term that we use at Influicity called air cover, which is basically you're doing all these things on the ground. Think about them like little soldiers on the ground that are that are you know having these little battles one by one. Those are all your Google ads, all your meta ads, Instagram, et cetera. Air cover is what's happening above the surface to make all those all that stuff on the ground work a little better. So what I mean by that is if you're running Facebook ads, that's really cool. And maybe you're getting a, a, a one to four ROAS, so a return on, on advertising spend. But if you can also run influencer marketing and then you're also have a super, you know, you're on a podcast and you also have a newsletter, that one to four ROAS might be one to six or one to eight ROAS because every time somebody sees your ad, they're more likely to click, they're more likely to convert because they've seen you somewhere else. This isn't the first time they're seeing you. So having a bank of content, having a presence somewhere else is getting more and more important every single day. Okay. That makes that makes a lot of sense. I like appreciate you answering that. Now, one other thing I want to ask you before I wrap up here. Where does mentorship, and I'm going off on a little little tangent here, but over your course of your career, you've you've had several ventures. Where do you think mentorship plays into this? Have you ever had any mentors that have been instrumental in your growth? And what are your thoughts around business owners having mentors? I've been super lucky to have mentors in my life, people that I met along the way that were maybe a bit older, a bit more seasoned than me. I would say my views have have sort of changed over time. So, you know, when you're really young, anybody who's willing to give you their time and their expertise is meaningful because you don't know anything. So anybody who has some experience, they're five, 10 years ahead of you, they can say, hey, you know, don't wear this to the job interview. Don't say this to the prospective client. That's just not a good idea. And you would have zero context for it. So when you're early on in your career, for me at least, just speaking personally, it was really valuable. And then even when I started my business and I was scaling my first business and I raised some money, which was a terrible thing. I would never raise VC again, but I did it early on because I didn't know any better. And I had some people that were there to help me along. As I've gotten older and as I've, as I've, I've become more seasoned, I feel like mentors, you need such levels of specificity that the people don't necessarily have it. So could I you know, use a mentor today to teach me more about the stuff I do? Yeah, maybe, but I pr probably would need like four or five people and I would need them to be super specific on one thing. So I just wrote a book. If I had somebody else, I do have a buddy who has a, you know, a Wall Street Journal bestselling book. He helped me a lot with the book, but I don't know that he can help me with other stuff. He was very specific in that area. So really figuring out where you need help and, and finding people who have maybe done that thing that that is always helpful. Does cash flow have you down? Profit not where you think it should be. Maybe it's the long hours. Let's meet to see if I can help. I bridge driving the financial performance of your business to hit growth and success targets. Book a complimentary meeting at meetforgrowth.com to get started now. Once again, that's meetforgrowth.com. I look forward to talking with you and Thanks for listening to the show. Really figuring out where you need help and, and finding people who have maybe done that thing, that, that is always helpful. Yeah, that's a great answer. Hey, so your book, or your website to your book, marketingsuperpowersbook.com. I'll say that one more time and I'll put this in the show notes at thinktyler.com. Marketingsuperpowersbook.com. I noticed when I went over there, there's some free things that people can get if they sign up. Tell me a little bit about the book before we wrap up. What, what are you trying to accomplish in the book? What, is the, what do you hope the reader gets out of it? So the concept of the book, really, at Influicity, I've spent the last decade working with over 20,000 influencers, all the people on YouTube and Instagram and celebrities in Hollywood, uh, because that's what we do at Influicity. One of the things we do is influencer marketing. And I started to think about it about three, four years ago. I was like, what are the best influencers doing that they're able to attract audience get a lot of attention, and in many cases, launch businesses that very quickly scale to seven or eight figures. What are they doing? Is it just that they're famous and therefore people buy from them? That's that's not the case because most of them do fail. Even if you're a famous face, you launch a business, a product, it doesn't do very well. 
but there's a set that do extremely well. And so the book is really an effort to dissect the formula. It's called Marketing Superpowers, Build a Brand So Good That Getting Customers Feels Like Magic. And I can tell you as someone who's done it myself, I've created an audience and I've then launched businesses off this audience. It really is like a whole different level of a playing field where you can actually say, hey, if I have the right content strategy, if I have the right audience strategy, and I'm able to uh, you know, have the right product, I can actually get not a ROAS of one or four or one to eight. My ROAS is like one to a hundred. I can spend a dollar and make a hundred dollars because I've followed the formulas that I've now laid out in the book. And really, I just want people to see and experience it for themselves. Wow. When, and when does that book hit the shelves? It hits the shelves June 18th. It's on pre-order now. And if it's after June 18th, when you hear this, go out and buy the book. Okay. I, I looked on Amazon. I don't think it's listed on Amazon yet as pre-order. Maybe I didn't search right. I, I tried to find it. Yeah, it is. If you go to marketingsuperpowersbook.com and click any of the buy links, I have Amazon, yeah. I have Barnes & Noble. It's available for pre-order. In different markets, it's a little different. So depending sure. on where you are. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, definitely grab a copy. And I'm excited. Uh, by the time this show is released, it should be uh, live and out there, uh, whether it be digital form or paperback, it should be live. So, hey, congratulations on writing the book. I'm sure that was quite a journey. It was, it was a journey. It was one year and it was a whole lot of, uh, of me staring at a Google Doc, <laughs> a, a lot of blank pages. And, and hopefully what, what, what I put out there is, is valuable. Did you have to go like... Uh, park yourself somewhere in an isolated space so you could just work for hours? It was it was a lot of sitting down and stumbling. And then once you get into the groove, you just can't stop. And and that that's what I found time and time again. It was always 10, 15 minutes of banging my head against the wall. And then I, boom, it comes and you just you, you keep going. What a cool accomplishment. Though. That, that's awesome. Hey, so your other website is influicity.com. And I'm, I'm not going to spell that out, but I'll, I'll put it in the show notes at thinktyler.com. I can't thank you enough, John, for being on the show. You you shared a bunch of little tidbits and words of wisdom. Anywhere else if people want to reach out to you or anywhere else they should go? Yeah, you can always get me at johndavids.com. It's just my name, J-O-N-D-A-V-I-D-S.com. Shoot me an email and uh, always happy to uh, to have new people in my circle. Thanks, man, for bringing the energy and the knowledge. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Tyler. Take care. That's all for this episode of Think Business with Tyler. But we have plenty more resources to help you in your pursuit of business excellence on our website at thinktyler.com. If you'd like to be featured in a future episode of the show, feel free to reach out to us on social media at think underscore Tyler. We look forward to helping you think life, think success, and think business.